Hello, my name is Yasushi Goro, and I'm here today with Professor Paul Pike. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the discussion on personalized therapy for non-small-cell lung cancer, biomarker testing, treatment and management in the presence of MET alterations. The first topic we will discuss is the evolving landscape on biomarker testing in advanced non-small-cell lung cancer. So this is a recommendation for biomarker testing. In the NSCCN guidelines, they're recommending to test all the EGFR, ALK, ROS1, BRAF, PDL1, MET, exon 4 b skipping, and so on. However, at this moment, the pen asian guideline is now showing that recommended for the biomarker testing is limited to EGFR, ALK, ROS1, BRAF, and PDL1. So now I would like to turn to Professor Pike to answer some precipitate question from our audience. Should we be testing beyond the minimum recommended oncogenic drivers in non-small cell lung cancer? How do different factors affect this decision, such as reimbursement and clinical effectiveness? I think the answer to that question has a historic context, but also a regional context. So if you asked this question to me about 10 years ago, then I would say as an academician, absolutely we should be testing for more beyond the minimum data set, because at the time the minimum data set for testing really centered on EGFR alterations and ALK alterations. Sometimes KRAS is kind of way of excluding these cases. And we did know that there were other targets that were being tested for uh, from an investigational standpoint. And so it was important for us to be able to do uh, testing beyond that kind of minimum scope. It's different uh, right now, historically, because we have nine targets to test for, and that's already quite a lot of targets to test for that all have paired target therapy options. And so right now, there really is no practical clinical need to test beyond the minimum data set, at least in the United States. And you add on top of that the requirement for pdl one TPS, and actually the issue is quite the opposite, that from a tissue resource utilization standpoint, we might not have enough tissue to do all of the testing that we need to do. Um, that's the case in the United States, but I am cognizant of the fact that uh, testing protocols are different depending on where you end up practicing. And so I'm curious, Dr. Goethe, in Japan, what that question looks like for minimum testing. Yeah. In Japan, we're fortunate that we can use any of the treatment we have just mentioned, such as outside of EGFR, ALK, we can now use ROS1, BRAF, RAT, KRAS, and so on. So because it is reimbursed, we also try to test all the test gene which we have the treatment. So I think the reimbursement and clinical effectiveness is very important because in some countries, if it's not reimbursed for the treatment, it is very difficult for the uh, physicians to ask for the patients to test them because we don't have any way to treat. So when is the best to perform the biomarker testing? And is there any preference from the patient's perspective? So the best time to test for these biomarkers is really at the time of diagnostic. And um, hopefully we all get to the point where this becomes kind of automatic because there are delays that can happen after biopsy in terms of processing the tissue and even finding the tissue for that matter for testing if it's been some amount of time. Uh, because we do need these results as soon as possible to really provide uh, up-to-date treatment recommendations for our patients for what the best treatment option is going to be, whether or not that's a targeted option or immunotherapy by itself or chemotherapy paired with immunotherapy. We need all of these uh, test results to come back to really be able to accurately guide a patient down that kind of algorithmic uh, pathway. And so it is as soon as possible. Um, and whether or not, as we'll discuss later, that's with a tissue biopsy or increasingly with a liquid biopsy, that is another approach that, um, that we can utilize. From a patient standpoint, um, testing is also, I think, best done right at the beginning. And it's increasingly with that understanding that patients are more willing to undergo rebiopsy, for example, if we do need material for testing, um, or undergoing a liquid biopsy if we need test results that are faster. Of course, that preference butts up against their clinical situation. If a patient is highly symptomatic from their disease, and we cannot wait for biomarker test results to come back, then we just need to start treatment. And by and large, that is either going to be chemotherapy or chemotherapy paired with immunotherapy to get to that point 
where patients do have some additional time for that testing to play out. Thank you. I think there is many options for the treatment in non-small cell cancer right now. So it is more and more important to test all the testing we can so the patients can receive the best treatment in the first line setting. Thank you for joining us. We hope this was applicable to your practice. Next, Professor Pike and I will discuss MET-XM14 skipping mutations in non-small cell lung cancer. Next, Professor Pike and I will discuss identifying MET-XM14 skipping mutations in non-small cell lung cancer. This slide is showing the prevalence of oncogene mutations in non-small cell lung cancer. In this slide, the KRAS mutation is 30 to 40%. In Japan or the Asian, I think the EGFR is much higher, such as 40% or so. The MET exome 14 speaking is showing in 1 to 10%. Now I would like to turn to Professor Pike to answer some preservative questions from our audience. What is the best and most efficient testing method for detecting MET exome 14 skipping mutations? How reliable and sensitive is this method? For me, the, the best testing methodology for finding MET-XM14 skipping um, gets subsumed under a broader question of what the best testing methodology is to find, as you had mentioned, Dr. Goda, before, all of the different op alterations that might be present in a newly diagnosed lung cancer patient that we're not going to know about a priori. And so we do need to find, in as much as it's possible, a single assay that can test for all nine different alterations. And the platform to do that uh, is a next generation ba uh, sequencing based assay uh, taking a look at DNA alterations. And that remains, I think, the gold standard now for comprehensive molecular testing. Whether or not that's in a tumor biopsy, and we do recommend still a tumor biopsy because there are features there that we do have to understand uh, things like histology, which still matters, PDL1, immunohistochemistry expression, that still matters. Whether or not it's through that or through a liquid biopsy, which is increasingly being used, uh, is something that we can debate in terms of relative merits and, and really coverage and reimbursement gets um, folded into that conversation as well. Uh, but that's really at the heart of what the best testing methodology for me is for MedXM14 skipping, because I need to know what alterations there might be even beyond and outside of that. Um, in terms of sensitivity and specificity, these um, specificity for NGS is, is quite good. <laughs> if the alteration's there, then it's, it's there. It's sort of true. Sensitivity is also quite good um, nowadays because of the read depth for next generation sequencing. But it's important to note that this is directly proportional to the tumor purity of the biopsy, if it's a tissue biopsy, because if the tumor content of that biopsy is very low, less than 10%, for example, and most of it is stromal, then the sen sensitivity is going to be diminished just because there aren't a lot of cancer cells. And of course, that's the reason why liquid biopsy has sensitivity issues, because this is circulating tumor DNA. If there's not a lot of tumor DNA that's in the blood, then a negative might well be a false negative. And so generally speaking, quite specific tests, sensitivity in general is quite good, but this will depend on some of the features of the biopsy that are present. So actually, how often do you do the liquid biopsy for your patients right now? So in the United States, liquid biopsy is increasingly being used at the time of diagnosis. And one of the strategies that my colleagues and I uh, employ both here at Memorial Sloan Kettering, but also in speaking to colleagues across the country uh, that they use at their centers is actually to order both. <laughs> and uh, whatever comes back first is what they'll go with, basically. Now, that is uh, understandably a position of luxury because we still have not really generally bumped into reimbursement issues with that approach. Uh, but that's going to be different depending on the region. So I wonder, Dr. Goto, what that situation is like for you in terms of being able to use liquid biopsy in Japan. Exactly. I believe that both testing is very useful. And then if we can, we can try to do it both at once. But unfortunately, in Japan, because of reimbursement issue, we cannot test at the same time. We should do liquid biopsy or tissue biopsy at the time of diagnosis. We have another chance of doing testing after the standard of care, but not at the, at the time of diagnosis. So that's the problem we have. How about the companion diagnostic in the US? 
So in the United States, companion diagnostics by and large are not being used. It's understandable that clinical trials would utilize these things, but um, as I had mentioned in the first question, um, what we're looking for at the time of diagnosis is broader than just what the companion diagnostic is looking uh, for. So the classic companion diagnostic example in the United States would be the scorpion arms assay for EGFR T790M. Um, in the acquired resistance setting for uh, first-generation EGFR-TKIs for the use of osimertinib. But the problem with that is that it only tests for T790M. Um, and nowadays, for example, we need to be no much more. For example, med amplification. And that applies also in the first-line setting. We need to know more than just if there's a med exon 14 skipping alteration or HER220 exon 20 insertion. We need to know if any of those nine targets is present. So from a practical standpoint, uh, companion diagnostics are not terribly useful. It's also a lot to ask different pathology laboratories to gear up to do these specific assays if they're not already set up to do that. It's a, it's a workflow issue. It's a resource utilization issue. It's a cost issue. Um, and so that's kind of the lay of the land for companion diagnostics in the US. I don't know if that's the case though for Japan, if there are other considerations. Yes, that's a big problem in Japan that, strictly speaking, we have to do the companion diagnostic to do the treatment for each drug. But that is not convenient. We have to change our minds, but right now we are facing those problems. Thank you for joining us. We hope this was applicable to your practice. Next, we'll be discussing targeting met exon 40 script mutations in advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Next, Professor Pike and I will discuss targeting met exon 40 skipping mutations in advanced non-small cell lung cancer. So this is the mechanism of action of inhibitors. We have several agents for targeting met exon 14 skipping mutation. Now I would like to turn to Professor Pike to answer some preservative questions from our audience. What can we learn from latest clinical research for MET inhibitors for patients with MET exome 40 skipping mutations regarding the clinical trial endpoints, efficacy, and comparison with other therapies such as chemo or the IOs? At this point, the pivotal phase two trials or phase one expansion studies for, I would say, pretty much most selective MET inhibitors um, has read out at this point. And the, and the major ones to know about would be the geometry study for capmatinib, the vision study for tapotinib, savalitinib, particularly in Asian countries, and the Profile 1001 uh, study for crizotinib. And outside of crizotinib, uh, it, for me, I tend to look at the data in aggregate for a couple different reasons that I'll get to in a little bit. But the aggregate data do show that irrespective of line of therapy and testing methodology, the overall response rate is about 50% uh, with a median PFS of 12 months and a median overall survival of about uh, 20 to, to almost 24 months in this population. And the reason why it's useful to think about the aggregate data is because one of the questions we have to answer is when we should use a selective MED inhibitor when we find a MED exon 14 skipping alteration. There are some uh, drugs where clearly we should use it in the frontline setting, and that would be things like osimertinib for each of our mutant lung cancer or electin mobilatinib for ALK positive lung cancer. The efficacy would just overwhelm uh, the efficacy for chemotherapy or immunotherapy based approaches. There are some that are different. So, Deracid, for example, um, for KRAS G12C mutant lung cancer, that is solidly a second line agent based on those efficacy data. With the data I just mentioned for selective med inhibitors, this for most of us really is a first-line therapy. Um, it's also a first-line therapy because we know that in this elderly population, uh, tolerability for chemotherapy-based approaches is going to be blunted. We also know that their ability to receive a second-line option after first-line therapy uh, goes down quite dramatically compared to younger populations. And so we really do need to try to find out what the best treatment option is going to be uh, to be able to employ um, in the upfront setting. We can borrow an insight into how these patients do from other data series like the Ipsos study where uh, investigators had treated elderly performance status impaired patients with single agent chemotherapy or single agent immunotherapy. And there the vast majority of patients could not receive a second line agent after first line therapy. And the median overall survival in that population was eight to 10 months. 
Now, eight to 10 months is a far cry from the 20 to 24 months we see with selective MED inhibitors. And so, again, this is why the NCCN guidelines, for example, recommends using a selective MED inhibitor in the upfront setting. So what is your idea about the similarities and differences in the MET inhibitors? Like with all cross-trial comparisons, we shouldn't do these things but we do them anyway. <laughs> I will reference some of these matching adjusted indirect comparisons that have been done. Um, in this space, I've been co-author on, on uh, one of these studies and, and MAIC has been uh, a tool that's uh, been used to try to get a better sense of what crosstalk comparisons look like. But I think for me, they are more similar than they are different for the selective MED inhibitors. This has really been borne out as time has gone on where the similarities include uh, improved efficacy in the upfront setting versus the later line setting for kepmatinib, uh, antipotinib, and savalitinib, um, and similarities in terms of the range of overall response rates that we see, which hover between really 45 to 60 uh, plus percent, depending on line of therapy, and also for the median overall survival data uh, that I had mentioned approaching two years for this class of medication. Th the other reason why we have to be careful is because there are some differences that are important to note in the way that the trials were executed. The vision study, for example, allowed patients to go on uh, who had MedXM14 skipping detected by liquid biopsy. And we do think, based on some subset analyses, that patients who have alterations found by liquid biopsy have a poor prognosis. Uh, these patients just are more symptomatic, they have higher burden of disease, um, and they're, as a result, natural history may be worse. And so it is a bit of an apples to oranges comparison to take a look at this cohort, um, either individually or when combined in a tissue biopsy cohort with a study that just enrolled patients by tissue biopsy. Um, and so that's why, for me, the similarities really outweigh the differences. Outside of something like crizotinib and profile 1001, which we know is a dirtier kinase, there the efficacy really do seem to be blunted compared to the selective MED inhibitors, which is why the selective MED inhibitors really are uh, the de facto standard if you're going to end up giving uh, one of these drugs in a patient with MedX on 14 skipping. Thank you for joining us and to Professor Pike for this interesting discussion on personalized therapy for non-small cell lung cancer, biomarker testing, treatment, and management in the presence of MAP alterations. In part two, Professor Pike and will discuss the emerging mechanism of resistance to targeted treatment in advanced non-small cell lung cancer and the role of MAP amplification in the post-EGFR TKI setting. Hello, my name is Yasushi Goto, and I'm here today with Professor Paul Pike. The next topic for discussion will be on the emerging mechanisms of resistance to EGFR TKI therapy in advanced non small cell lung cancer. So, even though about half of the patients is unknown for the resistance mechanism of EGFR TKI, there are other many mechanisms for resistance. Now, Professor Pike, let's look at some pre submitted questions from our audience. So what are the mechanisms or required resistance to the EGFR TKI therapy? So there are quite a number of different resistance mechanisms, uh, some of which are a little bit outdated uh, because of the change that we had quite a number of years ago in terms of what kind of EGFR inhibitor that we use. So many of us are familiar with the story behind erlotinib and gefitinib given in the upfront setting as first generation EGFR TKIs where the predominant resistance mechanism in upwards of 50 to 60% of patients was a secondary alteration in EGFR, this T790M mutation. So that profile is quite different now in the era of osimertinib as a third generation EGFR TKI where the resistance profile is very heterogeneous um, with nothing uh, approaching um, the high frequency that we saw with EGFR T790M alterations. The alteration that's uh, garnered the most attention is MET amplification, which happens, depending on the series you look at, anywhere between 7 to 30% of patients. And, and the problem with MET amplification, amplification in general, is that it's not a binary biomarker. It's a continuous variable in terms of the degree of amplification, the degree of gain, 
and the pattern amplification as well, clusters of signals, for example. And so that makes trying to figure out the exact frequency a little bit difficult. But because that's something that's easy to test for, and because we do have existing MET inhibitors, that's really been a, a target of a lot of uh, research interest. C797X alterations as a secondary EGFR alteration are relatively common, about 7 10, to 10% of cases. And that's been a focus of development, particularly for fourth generation TKIs to try to circumvent. And in some cases, you can use off, um, off-label first generation TKIs to try to circumvent this as well. And then there are lots of other bypass pathway alterations that happen at pretty low frequencies, things like PI3 kinase alterations, KRAS alterations, um, HER2 alterations. But these things are very difficult for us to target because we actually don't know in any particular patient if we find these alterations, whether or not they're biologically relevant. And combinatorial therapy in general is is relatively difficult. Uh, The sort of one thing that we do have to mention that's not captured by genomic information is histologic transformation, which is still relatively uncommon uh, but it's do- something that we do definitely see, both small cell lung cancer and squamous cell lung cancer transformation from the original lung adenocarcinoma. And the reason why that's important is, uh, A, you can only detect that by biopsy. And so that's why tumor biopsy is critical for patients in the acquired resistance setting. And then B, sometimes we can circumvent this resistance mechanism by pivoting to traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy, particularly for small cell lung cancer transformation, where these cases can be responsive to platinum uh, metoposide-based therapies. So what is your actual approach to the biomarkers in the TK refractory setting? Do you test the next generation sequencing and then the HE testing for the transformation, or do you think the other biomarkers are needed? It's an interesting question, and again, a kind of chicken egg question because you know we, if there are other biomarkers that are needed, that really is driven by the our biological understanding. And I think the problem is that our biological understanding is still um, in its relative infancy. Though we've been probing this for quite some time, um, and so next generation sequencing is still the mainstay to try to find uh, those alterations that I just spoke about, largely. Uh, through the lens of research purposes, to be able to gain information, to try to figure out exactly how to circumvent some of these alterations. Um, as you mentioned, a, a tissue biopsy is still required for histologic transformation purposes. I think the novel biomarkers will have to wait based on what kinds of biological information we have or based on other therapies that we'll talk about later um, that are uh, potentially interesting, things like ADCs, for example. Um, which are increasingly coming to a fore in all lung cancer cases, but also in each of our immune lung cancer, things like patrituzumab, deruxtecan, trop 2 inhibition. These ADCs um, are to some extent really begging for relevant biomarkers that may end up being immunohistochemistry based. So from that standpoint, some biomarker development uh, may follow the clinical development of treatments rather than um, taking a look at the underlying biology and then sort of that direction of development. Thank you. Thank you to the audience for watching. Next, Professor Pike and I will discuss targeted MET amplification in advanced non-small cell lung cancer and optimizing outcomes for patients. Next, Professor Pike and I will discuss targeted MET amplification in advanced non-small cell lung cancer. So these are the novel targets to overcome EGFR TK resistance. We have many targets. Now we'd like to turn to Professor Pike to answer some presented questions from our audience. How do MET inhibitors fit into the salvage pathway treatment approach where available options are limited? As I touched on before, MET inhibitors really have the most clinical data behind them in terms of being able to fit into that salvage pathway. Um, And so we are recommending, if you're going to do any kind of acquired resistance testing, that you do look at med amplification. Because if that's found, while there are no approved therapies in the United States yet to be able to circumvent this, uh, there have been phase one and phase two studies that have read out uh, both with first-generation EGFR TKIs as well as third-generation EGFR TKIs that do show fairly good data um, where a MET inhibitor can be added to an EGFR TKI to um, uh, engender a response. Response rates 
tend to hover around 30% if you just take a look at all the different studies um, with savalitinib, for example, in conjunction with osimertinib and other studies like that. Insight 2 has uh, recently read out in terms of overall response rate data at 50%, uh, giving osimertinib with tapotinib in this medamplified uh, population. And so while none of these agents are, are yet approved to be able to use in conjunction with osimertinib, the data suggests that that strategy is safe. And it is an off-label option because selective med inhibitors are approved uh, for Medexon 14 skipping non-small cell lung cancer. And so we are recommending that if a trial is not available in your local area, that you do try to use this in an off-label fashion, at least in the United States. Um, I'm unsure as to whether or not this would be an option potentially in Japan, though, uh, what kinds of freedoms you have to be able to do this. Yeah. Unfortunately, in Japan, the off-label use is not uh, allowed. So even if we have diagnosed with the MET amplification for the EGFR-TK resistance, and we still have uh, MET inhibitors for the MET x 40 skipping, we have no way to prescribe the MET, for MET inhibitors for the patients with EGFR-TKI. So we were waiting for the new trials data coming out and to be approved in the near future. What kind of clinical data do you believe that is most important for MET inhibitor treatment in the EGFR refractory settings? Of course, the things that we like to look at are overall response rate, um, and this is with an eye towards patients who are particularly symptomatic because we really do need their cancer to shrink if they're going to end up feeling better. Um, and then, of course, PFS data, how long the therapy ends up working. And uh, as I said before, the overall response rate data are, are decent for this approach, generally around 30%. Some other newer data suggest upwards of 50%. Some of this may depend on not the properties of the MED inhibitor, but rather the particular context for the patient uh, who has MED amplification detected in the acquired resistance setting. It, it, has there been a delay in uh, treating those patients on trials with MED inhibitors? Was there an intervening period where they received chemotherapy? For example, what is the nature of their progression? Um, because not all patients in the acquired resistance setting will have profuse and diffuse uh, progression. Many of these patients will have oligometastatic progression, and the natural history for that is quite different than patients who have just overwhelming disease progression. Um, so there are some uh, variables that are there that we'll need to keep in mind in terms of trial analysis, but those are really the endpoints that we like to look at. Interestingly, I think many of us in the field do have some concern that the PFS data may not be something that we can push very far with this strategy. This because main amplification, we have a feeling, is more of a heterogeneous um, uh, acquired resistance mechanism. This is not necessarily something that's clonal, at least uh, purely clonal in all sites of disease. There uh, are, we think, differences in terms of clonality. And if that's the case, then there is going to be a hard cap, uh, largely with the time-dependent endpoint, so PFS. And so it'll be interesting to, to see how the PFS data read out um, and how that interplay is present with degrees of metamplification uh, as well. Thank you. Um, I think as the other uncommon mutations such as like MET, uh, we have a good data for the phase two response and progression-free survival, but sometimes we're waiting for the phase three data or the randomized data. I hope some combination treatment or something will come out to be approved with the phase two data because that's more um, convenient for the patients to be treated. I think what you just mentioned is quite important from a regulatory standpoint because um, the phase, there are plenty of phase two data streams that basically show similar efficacy data. And while these are not randomized, trying to conduct a randomized trial in this population, uh, which is uh, fairly uncommon because it's a subset of patients who end up developing acquired resistance um, through med amplification is going to be relatively difficult. And there's going to be a, a fairly sizable time lag uh, between the initiation of a randomized phase three trial and when the data reads out. And there are going to be many patients, particularly in Asia, where EGFR mutations are much more common. And that's something we haven't talked about, but it's much more common in Asian countries um, as a driver of lung cancer, this is a big deficit and it really is an unmet need. So hopefully some regulatory agencies um, do end up approving 
these uh, approaches by phase two data alone? I hope so. Thank you to the audience for watching. We hope this was applicable to your practice. Next, Professor Pike and I will discuss optimizing outcomes for patients with met alterations in advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Next, Professor Pike and I will discuss optimizing outcomes for patients with met alterations in advanced non-small cell lung cancer. These are the sum of the data of the adverse events associated with met TKIs. Now I would like to turn to Professor Pike to answer some preservative questions from our audience. But adverse events are typically associated with event inhibitors. Do they differ depending on the setting in which these agents are used? The adverse event profile for MED inhibitors um, is pretty unique. Um, and the way that I would conceptualize this is that MED inhibitors, for reasons that are not entirely clear, do end up triggering some kind of vascular leak phenomenon. We see this reflected in the very high rates of peripheral edema. Across all of the different phase two studies of selective MED inhibitors, the rates of all gray peripheral edema is in excess of 50%. So usually the number is between 50 to 63%. There is no other class of anti-tumor drug that we use in lung cancer that has such high rates of peripheral edema. Um, in association with this, there seems to be a leak with regards to albumin. Um, patients can develop hypoalbuminemia. Albumin can go down to as low as the twos or the ones, which can exacerbate the peripheral edema issue. And you do see benign pleural effusions that happen in about 10% of patients uh, as a reflection of this vascular leak phenomenon. Again, we don't understand why that's the case. We do understand some of the kinetics behind this. Uh, it's important for providers to know that this is not a rapid onset adverse event profile. It takes time, particularly for the peripheral edema to develop. In the vision study, the median time to onset was two months. In the geometry study with capmatinib, the median time to onset was very similar, uh, measured around two to three months. And the time to resolution is also quite long in terms of dose holds and, and dose reductions. And so there's something very unusual that's going on that appears to be anatomic, uh, physiologic with this adverse event that's very important to keep in mind. There are other adverse events that do happen at lower frequency rates, things like transaminitis. Generally, that's not much of an issue though in the patients that are treated with selective med inhibitors. Benign increases in creatinine that have to do with basically the filtering of creatinine um, and so you can get a more accurate assessment of uh, GFR by using things like cystatin C, for example. Um, and then uh, much, much, much less common is interstitial lung disease or pneumonitis. We see this at very, very low frequency rates of about 1%. I have not yet seen pneumonitis develop in any of my patients treated with a selective med inhibitor. But like all uh, cancer drugs in lung cancer patients in particular, we do have to be mindful of the possibility of pneumonitis. Actually, I have experienced in one patient with the one ILDs, but if the patient has changed to another MET inhibitors, he was doing well for uh, months, she's still doing well. So it's very um, interesting uh, the mechanism or the reason of the ILDs, which is I think the same with the other treatment. So how should we optimize the use of MET inhibitors to elicit the best outcome for our patients with advanced multiple cell lung cancer? Because the development of peripheral edema and its resolution is very unusual and something that we're not used to, to managing as a result, we do have to be mindful of how that does intersect with efficacy. Um, as I mentioned before, it takes time for peripheral edema in particular to develop, and it takes a very long time for it to go away. And in addition to that, this is a patient population that tends to be elderly. The median age of diagnosis is around 72 to 73. So many of these patients are in their 80s. And as you and I, and as the audience knows, patients who are elderly have their own uh, particular set of circumstances that makes tolerability more difficult. So a grade one or grade two peripheral edema in the legs for a 40-year-old might be manageable, but for an 85-year-old who already is movement impaired, uh, who might have existing heart disease, this can be quite difficult for them to manage. Um, and so to be able to keep them on a drug that's working is going to be quite important. I can tell you that the edema is more uh, akin to lymphedema than it is to a kind of forward flow CHF picture. And so diuretics generally are not useful 
And so I've stopped using diuretics to manage this. It just kind of makes creatinine get worse and dehydrates patients. But it is lymphedema management. It is leg elevations at the end of the day. It is compression stockings. And I think most important anecdotally in these studies, we found that dose holds uh, are quite important. That holding for one, two, three, sometimes four weeks in order to allow the peripheral edema to resolve is going to be necessary and then resuming drug at a dose reduction. And there are quite a number of my patients where this kind of punctuated treatment is necessary in order to keep them on the med inhibitor in a way that's tolerable. And anecdotally, this doesn't seem to impair efficacy in those patients who are already responding. I'm curious though, Dr. Koto, it does sound like you've treated uh, a few patients at least with med inhibitors with med 14 skipping alterations. I'm curious as to what your experience is in Japan with things like peripheral edema management. I think the difficulty is exactly the same. I first tried the diuretics, but I never used recently because it's not so useful for the patients. One of the ways, as you have mentioned, to stop the dose and then we start after it improves a lot, a little, bit, a little bit, but as you said, it takes a long time to be improved. So it's very difficult for us to manage the peripheral edema uh, compared to the other agents. One of the idea I'm asking for the patients is try to walk around so that the, I think the, those move will may improve or may f- they feel better for the, uh, I think, uh, the peripheral edema when they just walk around or do the activities as uh, they, as they did previously. So that's one of my idea, but generally it's difficult, but I believe that it's very important for the patients to continue the treatment with the management of the peripheral edema. Thank you to the audience for watching. Thank you to Professor Pike for joining me for a discussion on personalized therapy for non-small cell lung cancer, biomarker testing, treatment and management in the presence of MET alterations.